and welcome to The Practical Prophetic, where prophetic ministry is made practical. I'm Beth Wingate, I'm your host, and welcome to the podcast. On our podcast today, we have an episode of Prophetic History. The person I want to bring to you today is known as the mother of Pentecostalism. Now, she is an elusive, almost forgotten character in the story of Azusa Street. And Azusa Street is the revival in Los Angeles that kicked off pretty much all of the charismatic and Pentecostal movements that were spread like wildfire around the globe and are still having an impact today. And a lot of people say it's a return to the book of Acts and one of the proofs that we are living in the last days and the beginning of latter rain, the last days outpouring of the Holy Spirit before Jesus Christ returns. Okay, let's get into this character in this story. Her name is Lucy Farrow. And so I want to dig into this character, and there's only one known photograph of her, and we know very little about her. She was a very humble woman, but she's really the the most uh, important person in the Azusa story. So I wanted to bring her story to you, and I wanted to talk about the prophetic aspects of her life, and that if Lucy can do it, then so can you. And so most people are familiar with William Seymour. He's kind of known as the father of Azusa Street. He was the pastor at the church at Azusa Street, but uh, he actually was mentored and influenced by Lucy Farrow. And Lucy Farrow was a part of Azusa Street, although she kind of was in and out. And so that's maybe part of why she was very elusive. But let's look into her story. I really think you'll enjoy this episode. So Lucy Farrow was born about sometime in 1851 in Norfolk, Virginia. Now, let's get a scene of the time of what was going on in 1851 in Norfolk, Virginia. So the United States had not had the Civil War yet. That would be about 10 years away. And there was a lot of contention over the issue of slavery, which was extremely divisive, enough so that it tore this country in half. And so with the Civil War, and we see that Lucy Farrow is born into slavery as a young black woman. And she's going to be about 10 years old when the Civil War starts, 10, 11 years old. Now, she is the niece, reportedly, of Frederick Douglass, the famous abolitionist who had become friends of the American president. Just amazing. We may do a whole episode on Frederick Douglass because he's an amazing character. But Lucy is born into slavery. We know virtually nothing about her first 20 years. We do know that she shows up in Mississippi in the 1871 census. She's living there, and we know that she's there for a long time. Now, by the time she's around 40 years old, we know that she moves to Houston, Texas, that she's a widow, and that she had had seven children and only two survived. So the first 40 years of her life are marked by uh, hardship. Just no other way around it. Just hardship. We know nothing about her. Now we can assume that she was a Christian because of what happens next. But we don't know about her conversion story. We don't know about the details of her marriage, her early life, how she ended up in Mississippi. Uh, we know nothing. We just know that between the Civil War emancipation and during reconstruction you know her her life seems to have been a mystery and so that's all we know about her but here's what we do know that by 1905 when she's uh, around 50 years old she is going to be pastoring a small holiness mission church in Houston Texas well let's just stop right there and talk about Uh, prophetic, the prophetic nature of our lives. Uh, A lot of us, you know, we are Western thinkers, and I just have to punch this in here. We're Western thinkers. We think of our life as a long timeline. But biblical Hebraic thought is more cyclical in nature, much like seed time and harvest, more seasonal. And so a lot of people may say in their 20s or their 30s, well, gosh, I haven't done anything remarkable. 
Give yourself some time. <laughs> it's not a it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. Give yourself some time. We know nothing but virtually about Lucy's first 40 years of her life. In fact, until she's 50, we know basically nothing about her until she's pastoring this small church in Houston. And so I just want to interject right there. Whatever God does for Lucy, he's no respecter of persons. He will do for you. And her ministry... We don't know that it had even started before she was in her 40s or 50s. So, you know, give yourself time. Be patient. Let the Lord work through you. If you feel like you've been called to do something, then then be patient and be prepared in a season of preparation until that time comes. Well, Lucy's pastoring this small holiness congregation. Let me stop right here, too, and talk about holiness. So before there was the label of Pentecostal or charismatic, there was an emphasis, especially out of the Methodist churches and some of the Baptist churches about an emphasis on holiness. A lot of this comes from John Wesley, who was the father of Methodism. So holiness, they believed at that time, was how you really drew close to the Lord to have these encounters with the Holy Spirit. John Wesley is famous for the quote that says, my heart was strangely warmed. And and really what he was describing, what he did not have language for at that time, the way we understand it today, was the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so Wesley uh, just, he had to find ways to describe what he was experiencing. And so holiness was a, a an emphasis that people had on drawing close to the Holy Spirit. And of course, you know, we know that that crossed over into some legalism, but the core message is solid. And so we don't want to forget that. And so we see that Lucy is pastoring one of these churches. And so the whole point of a holiness church is they are seeking an experience, an encounter, a closeness to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so we see that uh, she has a famous person or someone who will become famous who is in her congregation. He's about 10 years younger than her, and his name is William Seymour. And so that's where the connection begins. The very foundation. Now, let's just get this. Let's look at how God sees things. Let's look, let's put things in perspective. The very foundation for Azusa Street, which, by the way, if you're in a uh, full gospel, charismatic, Pentecostal, or mostly what I would call a non-denominational church today, your spiritual heritage is connected to do, to these two people who were both African-American in the South, the Jim Crow South, born into slavery, and they're at a small, rural, holiness, tiny hole-in-the-wall church in Houston, Texas, which, by the way, during this time, uh, Houston is, is a new frontier. It's, it's you know, vast and, and uh, sporadically settled. And so this is where the ember began for the spark at Azusa Street and the flame there that that ignited the entire world. Amazing. Just amazing. We have to learn to see things the way the Lord sees them. You know, God only gets the glory when he chooses the most unlikely places and the most unlikely people. I love it. I love it. Okay, so Lucy is pastoring this church, and William Seymour is a member of her church. Well, there is a crusade, a holiness crusade. These, you know, these traveling tents would come around and people would come from all over and you would have camp meeting. And that was very popular around the turn of the century. And people would preach and uh, pray for people to be healed. And there would be an evangelism call. You know, you got to remember, this is frontier times, post-civil war. You've got PTSD that people didn't understand back then. And so alcoholism has plagued the nation. And so these tent revivals, these circuit rider preachers who would go out into the rural areas and they would put up tents and people would come from all over and have camp meeting. That was important in those communities. And this is something that would really, you know, a lot of people didn't have access to a local 
church or, or it was a long horse ride, you know, to your nearest church. And so these camp meetings were pretty important. And people would, um, this would be an opportunity for people really to hear the gospel and to be confronted with the sin in their life. And so these were important. And so there is a crusade in Houston that summer. And Charles Fox Parham, which he's also an important figure in the Azusa story. But this is the this is the origin. This is the foundation. This is the level number one of how these people are drawn together. And so Parham is hosting a crusade. He's one of the the keynote speakers. He will also be a uh, Bible school. He starts a Bible school. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so he's doing this crusade and he gets to know Lucy Farrow. She's a pastor of, you know, of a local church. Now, Parham is white. Lucy is black. And so uh, they begin to have a conversation and uh, they become friends. They uh, evidently, you know, had some kind of conversations. He invites Lucy to speak at some of the meetings. Now, you have to understand uh, the country is segregated at this time. There's Jim Crow laws, especially in places like Texas. But a lot of these camp meetings were very integrated. You know, the early Pentecostal Christians, and I'm just going to use that as a blanket term, the Pentecostal Christians, they were open. They they had people of all races and backgrounds preaching, singing, you know, doing things. And so there was not racism within the camp meetings that we know of. I'll talk about that in a minute. And so, uh, but because when they would send out people and they would do things, and I'll get back to that, there's going to be a reason that race plays a role. And, and we'll talk about that at the end with the formation of the Assemblies of God and how this all connects. So Lucy and Parham strike up a friendship and he wants to take Lucy back to where he's from in Kansas. But he they understand the times that, you know, they're not ignorant to, to the things going on. So what he does is he hires Lucy to be a cook initially for the crusade, which let me just stop right there and say this too. If you're a pastor and you're there's a big crusade that comes to town, it's not uncommon for you to serve, no matter what your race is, to serve your congregants and the people that you want to come. So evidently she may have been a role in hosting him even coming here. We don't know that. The records are, are, are lost. There's no records. But for whatever the reason, uh, and, and maybe it was because she was African-American, she was hired to be a cook for the crusade and, and her and Parham, she's also preaching at the crusade and her and Parham strike up this friendship. He hires her to be a governess and to come back with him for his children to Kansas. I don't know that that's a need he had or this was a way to facilitate bringing her to Kansas. We're really not clear uh, on, you know, what the motive was, but but he brings her with his family back to Kansas. Now, uh, he has a Bible college that he starts around 1905 in Kansas and Lucy is there somehow connected and somehow connected to this Bible college. Now, it would have been segregated. It wouldn't have been, uh, she wouldn't have been able to actually formally attend that college because of the racial issues in the country at that time. But we know that sometime in January of 1906, she sends word that she wants uh, William Seymour to come to Kansas also and to come to Parham's Bible College. Now, Parham will not allow, or the, or the university, or however this works, it wasn't allowed for Seymour to be in the class, but Parham uh, arranged for him to have a desk outside the door. And so, like I said, segregation at that time was, was real. And so racism was real. And so, uh, but Seymour is able to listen to the classes and he becomes a star pupil. Well, sometime around March of 1906, uh, someone in Los Angeles requests to have a pastor and William Seymour is sent by Parham, or, or on his own, we're not really sure, but, but Seymour is sent out to Los Angeles to pastor a holiness church. Now, this church was run out of a house out on Bonnie 
Bray Street, and they have asked for Seymour to be the pastor. Now, probably how this went is they would have taken a, uh, you know, taken a big deal for them to take up money to get him a train ticket, and they probably couldn't pay him, but what they could do is give him room and board to be the pastor, which is probably how that worked. Now, let's get the scene of Los Angeles during this time. You have Los Angeles is booming. Uh, You have the docks, you have the railroads, you have trade going on. And so you have a huge immigrant population. You have a huge population of people who had formerly been slaves who have come out there for work. You have military people, you have uh, business people who are coming to expand their business. You have a lot of Asian immigrants who mostly were brought on for the railroad. And so you have a melting pot. Uh, You know, it's really interesting that the the way Los Angeles was begun. And so you see Seymour has been put right in the middle of this as a pastor to a white congregation. So that's interesting, too. A lot of uh, a lot of things you would think would not be happening during this time. They absolutely were. OK, so, and, and this is a booming time in in. Our culture and our nation. Uh, Just to give you some ideas, the most popular book around this time would have been White Fang. You know, Mark Twain was tops of the of the list, and and all of his writings. Chicklets was had just come out as a gum. You know, you've got things like this going on. So uh, William Seymour uh, comes out to the church, and. and Seymour establishes himself as a pastor. Now let's go back to Lucy Farrow. This is in the mid uh, middle part of March 1906. So Lucy ends up going with Charles Parham to Virginia. And uh, they will hold a series of meetings. And then Lucy will be speaking in Portsmouth, Virginia. And there's an incident that is recorded here where they did a a series of meetings. And there's indication that between Kansas and Virginia that her and Parham and and probably a group of ministers had uh, ministered in these camp meetings and tent revivals and and, uh, special services along the way. And so we know that while they're in Virginia, Lucy will pray for people and about 150 people were recorded to have received the baptism and the Holy Spirit, and 200 people were saved. Now, this is uh, this is pre-Azusa Street. This is uh, leading up to Azusa Street. And then we see that in December of 1906, so later that, just a few months later, that Lucy is going to travel with a group of ministers to New York City. So we have her recording on recorded uh, sailing out of New York with a group of ministers, and that was on the ship's manifest. And then they travel to Liberia. Okay, so some records indicate that Lucy, her ancestors knew that they were from Liberia, and that's part of why she wanted to go to Africa to evangelize people who she may have been connected to, you know, through her heritage. But uh, Lucy goes and she spends some time in Liberia and she ends up uh, making a relationship with the crew people. Uh, and that's K-R-U, the crew people who also had their own language. Well, Lucy uh, supernaturally was able to understand and speak crew. And so this was recorded in several books. And, and I just want to sidebar right here that uh, this area today, and I don't know about in, in the 19, early 1900s, but today that uh, Liberia is about 80% Muslim, and it's rare to have Christianity in Liberia, but of the crew people, and there's about 300,000 of them today, 80% of them are Christian, and we can credit the bulk of that to Lucy Farrow and and her mission to the crew people. Lucy will end up being in Johnsonville while she's in Liberia, and uh, she does preaching, teaching. There was healing services. People were receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so she had an amazing impact. She was there for about seven months, and her impact is still being felt in Liberia today. All right, in 1907, she returns. 
she comes back to Virginia and she will stay there for a few months. Then she'll move to North Carolina where she will hold some uh, meetings at an apostolic mission there. And then in the last half of 1907, she comes back to Azusa Street. Now, I have to talk about this for just a minute. Seymour, his congregation then takes up money to buy Lucy a train ticket to come out and basically, I guess he's talked about her, and to come out and and visit the church, maybe as an evangelist. And they send the ticket by letter back to Kansas in faith, hoping she would come. That's, you know, that was a lot of money for back then to send, you know, a ticket for a train from Los Angeles to Kansas. That's that's a big deal. And they didn't even know if she would come. And so she does. She accepts and she comes. This is an amazing story. Now, this is where things really take off. So in 1907, probably sometime in March, Lucy arrives back at Los Angeles, and she makes her way to the Lee home at Bonnie Bray House, where William Seymour is pastoring, and they are going to host a dinner for her. So she's at this home of Edward at the Lee's house, Edward Lee's house, and Lee really was seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, Seymour is too at this time. He has not actually received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, they say there's two accounts here, but I think if we blend them together, we get the accurate account. Now, some say that he was sick. Some say that he just uh, really desired the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was probably both. But he basically asked for Pharaoh, for Lucy Pharaoh to lay hands on him to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And she declined. She said, I cannot do that unless the Lord tells me. Now, she's already gained a reputation Uh, for laying hands on people. In fact, she's been given the name as the anointed handmaiden. So people are really coming at her, wanting her to lay hands on them to receive the baptism, which uh, is a new experience for the church or or, a newly understood experience for the church. And so he asked her and she says no. But then they begin to eat, and uh, Lucy, they said she laid down her fork, pushed her, I'm I'm reading an account, uh, her chair from the table, around the table to Edward Lee, and said, the Lord says I can now lay my hands on you for the Holy Ghost. Now, she prays for him. They said he fell out of his chair and began to uh, speak in tongues while laying on the floor. And in fact, here's one account that he wrote. He said, The Spirit of God struck me like a bolt of lightning. The power of God surged through my body, and I began speaking in tongues. Amazing. So this really is going to be the spark that sets off Azusa. This will go into publications. You have these little pamphlets and publications that would be sent out from churches and and camp meetings and, and places like this. And Azusa Street, one of the reasons everything they become sort of the epicenter is they really were on top of their uh, pamphlet game. And so they send these publications out, they get passed around, copied, you know, and get just spread all over sort of like when the internet first came out, you know, this was their form of like the internet. And so it just goes out like wildfire. And um, uh, Azusa grows. In fact, Azusa will outgrow Bonnie Bay, Bray Street house. They end up buying an abandoned building that becomes Azusa Street. Uh, Seymour will later get the be filled with the Holy Spirit. But Lucy does not really stick around. Uh, she's sort of in and out during this time preaching. Uh, she will return to Houston where she preaches in another camp meeting where people are are filled with the Holy Spirit. And in fact, there's one account here. It says that she goes to the home of, uh, she prayed for a man named Howard Goss, who had been uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. She lays hands on him, and it said that uh, he began to speak with other tongues. This is in Houston. And then Goss and Ian Bell will host a conference later, and I'll come back to this because this is an important. But let me go back to Lucy Farrow. So we're around, uh, that was in 1911. Uh, during these years, Lucy will go 
sort of go back and forth between Houston and Azusa Street. And when she's in Los Angeles at Azusa Street, they have some kind of a building uh, connected. It said Outback, so I don't know what that means, but it's called Faith Cottage. And they would house her and take care of her when she was in Los Angeles. Now, she's getting older. Uh, She ends up returning at some point and staying with her son in Houston in a very humble house. And um, and and people will will come visit her and ask her to lay hands on them. Uh, Like I said, she's got this uh, nickname as the anointed handmaiden and and so that's what people are known you know she's known as and people from all over come to see her and they they usually send for her probably once a year to come out to Azusa for several months and then she'll go back home and and she prays for people and and um and so that's sort of what happens later in her life now this is the part that is so prophetic that even Lucy had no idea the impact of just being someone who followed the Lord and who loved the Lord and and wanted and desired to be close to the Holy Spirit, to the Lord. Uh, The two men, Goss and Bell, later in 1914, they will host a conference in Hot Springs, Arkansas. And out of this conference, uh, the Assemblies of God will be established. Now, let me talk about that for just a minute. So we, we're, we're forming denominations around this time out of Azusa Street. Pentecostal and charismatic denominations are being formed around this time out of Azusa Street. They're coming out of the Methodist mostly and Baptist churches, and these denominations are being formed. So you first have the Church of God in Christ, which is a predominantly African-American denomination. And Bell and Goss who Lucy Faro prayed for, uh, Goss, they are white ministers ministering with the Church of God in Christ in the South, and that did not go over well. In fact, it is the Church of God in Christ's leadership that tells them they should form their own denomination. And there was people already wanting to form a, a different denomination. You've got segregation, and that plays a role in this, and there is racism that is woven into this story. But largely, uh, there's a lot of unity in this story, too. And so uh, they encourage the young white ministers to form their own denomination, uh, which will become the Assemblies of God. And that is actually formed really out of Azusa Street, but also out of the Church of, God, Church of God in Christ denomination. A lot of people don't know that, that AG came out of the COGIC. So, and that's, uh, you know, just abbreviations for those that people use. And um, you're going to see that uh, once Hot Springs, Arkansas has this conference and forms this denomination, and I think there's about two or 300 people that started the denomination, and it really was birthed out of Azusa, but also out of the people that held camp meetings after that, and evangelism works after that, that it just exploded. And so uh, I want to talk about the impact of Lucy Farrow today, because we don't know much about her. We do know that in 1911, while she was living at the home of her son, she will die of complications from tuberculosis. Uh, she had some kind of a respiratory issue. I looked at her death certificate, and it just uh, says uh, that she had swelling and scarring in her lungs connected probably to, bur- to, to, to tuberculosis. They think she probably contracted that while she was in Liberia. So she probably had some kind of a chronic cough after that and uh, developed a, a lung condition. And she dies in her 60s in uh, Houston, Texas, where she's buried at the Olivewood Cemetery. Well, her impact, though, still goes on because now through these young ministers, Goss and Bell, with the Assemblies of God, they uh, change the world. The Assemblies of God is the largest Pentecostal denomination in the world. Now, inside the U.S., they have three million members. It's much more if you include global, uh, with 13,000 churches, 40,000 ministers, and over 5,000 missionaries. And so uh, her impact has been felt throughout time. And you cannot discount the contribution 
of Lucy Farrow. We know so little about her early life. This is a woman who didn't really start her ministry until she was in her mid to late 40s. And then she was really the linchpin. She's the connector between Parham and Seymour. She's the one who mentored uh, Seymour. And obviously, she had some kind of impact on Parham. And uh, she uh, has an impact on the crew people. And she has an impact on all of modern-day Pentecostalism and and, and charismatic churches. And so we got to give our credit to Lucy Farrow for just being someone who's hungry to draw close to the Lord and look what the impact she had. And people, most people don't even know her name. And so she's really been called one of the forgotten, uh, you know, members of Azusa Street because there's just not a lot of information. She didn't stay there long. She never stayed in one place long. She was always on the go. And uh, she just wanted to to draw close to the Lord and minister to his people. And like I said, she's known as the anointed handmaiden. And so I pray that blessing on you today, that wherever you go, you will be an anointed handmaiden or man of God, and that it will have an impact uh, far beyond your own life for the kingdom of God. I hope you enjoyed this episode on Lucy Farrow, the mother of Pentecostalism. Have a blessed day. For listening to today's podcast. Please be sure to hit the subscribe button so you'll be informed next time I post. Thank you again and have a blessed day.